T-minus, 60 seconds and counting. We passed T-minus 60. 55 seconds and counting. Neil Armstrong just reported back. It's been a real smooth countdown. We passed the 50-second mark. Power transfer is complete. We're on internal power with the launch vehicle at this time. 40 seconds away from the Apollo 11 liftoff. All the second stage tanks now pressurized. 35 seconds and coming. We are still go with Apollo 11. 30 seconds and coming. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and coming. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10. Nine. Ignition sequence starts. Six. Five. Three. Two. One. Zero. All engine running. Hello and welcome to the bullpen. I am James Roy and with me is Tom as always and we have a special guest Jason Braddock. Jason, how are you doing today? Hey, what's going on guys? Appreciate y'all having me on the show. Love the intro there. Get me fired up. And always great to see a familiar face. James, I appreciate you having me on but gotta salute my guy Thomas, man. One, one of the most positive, great guys. Awesome to be around. So I'm more than excited to join you guys. Appreciate the invitation. All right. Well, let's get right to it. First, we'll talk to Tom. I want to know how Tom's doing. I always do that to you, but I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Jason, so glad to have you on the show. Totally excited. When when James told me he was able to get you on, I can't tell y'all how, how much of a treat you're in for because as far as draft coverage goes, I don't know of a better guy than Jason Braddock. I mean, he's knowledgeable to the roof on everything, but especially with the draft, I learned so much from this man, not just that, but in life. Super excited to be on the show with you. Uh, let's get into it. Awesome. Let's do it. Thank you, Tom. I'll start us out. Um, the first question that I have for you revolves around the cornerback position. So the Texans have made quite a few moves, adding uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Okuda, uh, D, or, ooh, CJ Henderson. Um, it seems like they're really buying on the market of former – top 10 picks that could potentially be good with that in mind. I think a lot of people view the Texans as a team that could draft a corner relatively early into where they are in the draft. But, but how do you view that and what prospects are you tracking that the Texans could potentially take? Yeah, no question. I think you hit the nail on the head there uh, as far as what this front office likes doing. And this goes back to the new England days. They love getting those former cast off highly drafted first round picks that may not have hit their full potential, then what they would do in New England, they would take them and play them to their strengths. So they would see on film and they would go back to their evaluations pre-draft and hold true to their own evaluations and not what they've already seen in the league. And they will give those guys that extra opportunity. And with this, uh, we see guys flourish, you know, throughout it. And so now we see them trying to do it with Jeff Okuda and also CJ Henderson at those cornerback positions. And I believe when you have so much zone coverage with their length and their speed and their skill set, then you can really take advantage of and not ask them to go outside of their comfort zone. When you've got uh, Daniel Hunter and Will Anderson Jr. in the interior pass rush constantly getting after them, then you're not asking too much of these corners. But I agree with you, James, where this can't be plan A, B, and C. So I would look for them to go with one of those two second round picks or at least the number pit, number 86 overall in the third round use on that cornerback and there's a lot of talent in this draft 100 percent. i know that you you've highlighted a, a player you put on my radar just through your content and if you guys aren't familiar and you don't follow jason on twitter like he has his cheat sheets that'll really help you out with like seeing players you, you told a story about how you um you called out darius slay as a high tier talent when a lot of other people didn't see it um but ennis rakestraw from Min missouri is a guy that you called out now do you do you think he's a great fit for the texans and can you elaborate on like what really drew your eye to him uh, everything i mean you watch the guy and i'm sitting there and 
I'm old school. So I use P, uh, pencil and pen. I've got five subject notebooks for offense, five subject for defense. I like to go back and my memory's not what it used to be. So I like to have my notes and I look at the positives and it's been zone, off, press. I mean, everything that you want them to do, the versatility there, the size. But a lot of times we fall in love with what's sexy on film and what's sexy on film, length, speed, explosiveness. And those guys get pushed down in the drafts. I think the comparison I made, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was going back to a draft where I had a first round grade on Casey Hayward. Everybody, oh, no, he's second round. And I believe he did go in the second round. Well, the NFL continues to make the same mistakes, what they look for and prospects. But you go watch Casey Hayward. I don't care about his 40 time. I cared about how he played A.J. Green when Vanderbilt went against Georgia. Wait, how you got a top five wide receiver in the draft? And we know how rare it is for wide receivers to go in the top five picks since 2000. Uh, so now you got a top five wide receiver that everybody says is top five in the draft in A.J. Green. And you got Casey Hayward doing all kind of coverage and locking them up and playing well. So the tape is always king. Tape should be 90 percent of it. The only time you should go away from the tape, I would say, is medical. If you have medical concerns, chief medical concerns, absolutely, you can drop a guy. I don't have those issues with Rachel. This is a top 20 pick. I would take over both Bama corners, the Clemson corner. This guy's going to be a stud. And I don't say this to pat myself on the back and brag. It's just more of a resume when you talk about past drafts. And I'll talk about guys I missed on and all that as well. Cornerbacks, Xavier Howard was my number one pick. Stokes. I mean, you could go through the last 15 years. I've been pretty money on corner. What makes it even more unique is that until this year, I finally got black market all 22 film for college prospects. I haven't had all 22 on college prospects since 2012, you know, when I was working for Eric Galco at Optimum Scouting. And so you'd have to, I would caution people who are watching at home that's making all their assessments off of game film, man. Take it from me personally, you will have some huge misses because you'll miss 60, 70 percent of these players games without that all 22. Now in the year 2024, five dollars a month, you can get black market. I'm not throwing anybody out, out there. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. Don't DM me because I don't know if you're a snitch. Uh, but trust me, I'm 45, not technically savvy. And I found it and it's changed the game for me this year. This is the first year I've had more than 10 percent of prospects all 22 fam and i haven't had any all 22 since 2012 so what i would have to do is watch game film watch uh the tv copy and watch it from every angle they give three four five times so it makes the process a lot more no matter how much you do it you just miss so much without the sideline view and the end zone view so i would tell you pay the five dollars a month find the black market all 22 and your assessment's going to start changing on these guys nice nice so we talk um, about assessment. I'm dying to know, what do you think? And, and this just kind of leads into, I guess, where we feel the Texans may go. What do you think of the job that Nick Casario has done evaluating talent and moving up and down the draft? And how do you feel like he's going to be able to attack this draft to get that top tier talent that you talk about? Well, let me put this out there. I, I grew up a Broncos fan. I lost fandom years ago, over 15 years ago. Uh, when I first started covering the Texans, you get around the players, you get around the business side of it, and fandom goes out the window. I love seeing teams from the city of Houston do well. Astros, Texans, Rockets, U of A's. Cool for them. Hope they do well, but I don't have the fandom because I realized early on it was blinding me on evaluations. You want to see stuff that's not there sometimes, and you look, turn the eye another way. Well, let me see it another two, three times before I note this. You know what I'm saying? So uh, that being said, this comes from someone who's not a diehard Texans fan, not buying from this, was not a big Patriots fan. Uh, Nick Casario is a genius. Nick Casario has, and D'Amico Ryans, I don't want to take away from that. And I also take a tip of the hat to Cal McNair and Hannah McNair. I think we saw a conscious effort after Easterby and Bill O'Brien and all that left that they said, we're going to clean house from, you know, top to bottom. And that's what they did. Callan Hanner has been more visible to the public. Now he's full owner for the Texans. Uh, so it's just great to see how they realize. And a lot of time you have to self-evaluate. I did it myself back in 2022 when I walked away. I said, man, I'm making mistakes. I've got flaws. I need to fix me before I can worry about evaluating others. And the Texans did that. Nick Cassera, the higher D'Amico Ryans, 
100% ballpark homer. I mean, he just killed it. And the decision, everybody criticized it. Trade up for Will Anderson Jr., you're giving up too much. Listen, when the players own the team, the compensation's out the window. And we saw the return on investment in his rookie season. In his rookie season, Will Anderson is the only edge player to rank top three in pass, pass rush win rate and run stop win rate. Miles Garrett was two and seven. He bested Miles Garrett, excuse me, Miles Garrett in his rookie season, and now he's working out with him in the offseason. I don't care what he gave up for the compensation. Will Anderson Jr. is on this team for up to the next five years on a rookie salary and CJ Stroud. Casero is a genius. I love, I, I have nothing negative to say about that man. Oh, 100%. I think a lot of people, it's like you said earlier, fandom will kind of blind you to it. Um, and it's also, Casero is doing a lot of things that other GMs aren't doing. And, and sometimes right. when you're doing stuff that other people, that's not like the norm, people will cr criticize you for it. But I, I, I've moved to a position of kind of like a trust and we'll see with Nick. I'm just like, okay. Trading Malik Collins for a seventh. I don't know if that makes any sense, but you I'm know, with maybe, you on that. Yeah, it's like I don't know. There, there's got to be a method to the madness. I want to shout out um, Young Ari Gold. James Carlson's in the chat. He said nice. the Jason Braddock, the goat. Uh, Young so Ari he, Gold. Haven't seen him in a while, man. Hope you're doing well. <laughs> he's doing. He's actually Young Ari Golf now. He does golf stuff. So. Oh yeah, I did. Out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what. Yeah, he's. I saw him. Uh, he's got some polos and different stuff. So man, if y'all really into golf, go go holler at him. He's got some great gear coming out. Young uh, Ari Golf. I, that's right. I thought it was Ari Gold. It used to be. Shout out to Inland Grove. That's the brand name. It's, it's actually really good stuff. Uh, nice. Yeah, I've seen some dropped. of that stuff. We've um, got to support. We've got to support these people from Houston, man. We've got so much talent here. Over seven million people in all avenues. We got to support these. While well, I'm thinking about another guy, long time follow on Twitter, I exchange stuff. Zep, nineteen seventy eight. I don't know if his handle changed a little bit. Used to do. Oh, sports. he's been on really? here before. He's the oh, bike awesome. producer. He does book reviews. I mean, the dude's got a genius mind as well. He pivoted from sports to that. Support all this Houston talent, man. Like, there's so much room for all of us, especially now with the Texans being what they are. Everybody come in. The water's warm. 100%. 100%. Um, it, back to the draft talk. I know you've just recently started your review of receivers, but yeah. um, I'm interested to see your thoughts, not just on that, but uh, I, I think. I don't know. I've been, having been a Texans fan for this long, I feel like wide receiver is just the default. The Texans should pick a wide receiver unless they need a quarterback. And even then people are like, well, maybe they could just get a better wide receiver and they'll be good. Um, <laughs> as, as we saw last year with people who thought that maybe the Texans should hang on to Davis Mills as the starter. But looking at this draft, it's really deep. And I, as much as it's frustrating, just from like, a, I like first round picks because fifth year option and, and all this other you know, stuff that, that is more appealing about that. Trading out of the first round, it, it's a deep draft, and there's still a lot of wide receiver talent that could be available to the Texans at that point. Where do you think the Texans might, should go after a receiver, and what, what receivers are you tracking that would fit well with what the Texans are trying to do? Yeah, I've heard the same thing as you. Early on, before free agency, a lot of the fans, wide receiver, need to get that wide receiver. And I, like, I like Noah Brown as a third. I think we're ruling out John Mechie. I mean, last year was basically his rookie season. I mean, we've got to put ourselves in John Mechie. What he's overcome with the injury the last year coming into the draft, then the cancer diagnosis. I mean, I'm pulling for this kid. I'll tell you, I have fandom for John Mechie. I would, you know. Other prospects, I like George Pickens and Alec Pearson that second round that year. So I wasn't on board with the pick. And then uh, Nick Casario, like you said, I kind of just, even if I don't agree, I keep my mouth shut because now with what he did with Nico and Tim Dale in the third round, it's like, hey, I'll shut up. And for the first time, this is probably the first general manager that even if I don't agree, I don't really push back that much because I'm like, this dude knows what he's doing, man. The rings, uh, the flags on the walls, however you want to say it. But at that wide receiver position, my opinion is now pivoted to where they were pre-free agency, but it has to do with the move Casario has made in D'Amico and the Texans. Excuse me. They've set the roster up to where now you can say wide receiver is the biggest need. I mean, that's just the way they set up the roster. And I had to go back and uh, credit where it's due, due. I saw somebody on Twitter that was talking about 425 to new 4-3, and I thought about that. I'm like, oh, man, that's 
And that's pointless. I mean, it's been that way for over five years. But then I thought about it. I went back and looked at the Texans roster on our lads. Our lads does a great job with depth charts and color code and everything. Check it out if you haven't seen them. And I'm looking at the Texans roster and all of a sudden the light bulb goes on. I'm like, oh, my God, it's so simple. But yet I overlooked it with my tunnel vision. They built this roster to a 425. Because like he said, and again, I apologize, I forgot who mentioned it on Twitter, but like the guy said, 4-2-5 is the new 4-3. That's the base defense now. And you're in sub packages 70% of the time. So 4-3 looks, you're only in 30%. That's your sub package. And the Texans have seemed to make a pivot to where they built this roster. And mainly what I would point to is the thinness at linebackers, what they have at linebackers. They're not really set for 4-3 going into the season unless you're looking at four three as a sub package you're like oh well henry can come in play some middle can kick outside and give you only 30 percent of the plays and you can also add other players there at the position as well we saw it last year when cashman and harris were in and um what we call sub packages as the two linebackers henry would come in and play middle linebacker in the four three looks and cashman and harris would kick outside and so uh starts clicking and making sense to Nico Autry you watch him with the Titans last year when he's on the interior and he's having to hold up against double teams he's getting knocked around he gives up his side he's getting knocked flacked on the ground but when he comes inside on pass rush situations he's a nightmare and he can also rush to pencil him in that move makes more sense and also not bring him back Sheldon Rankins I know they had interest in trading Malik calls it makes more sense now when you look at these guys being able to play the one technique and the three technique and also position versatility on a couple and they kick out the D in the situation as well. But Autry makes more sense as a D tackle in base if we're talking base being four two five. I'm um, sorry, I know I'm getting a little sidetracked and long winded here, but the, I, I went all the way off on it, just how the roster build. I get a little dorky sometimes, but back to the wide receiver position. Saying that the way they constructed the defense, now if you're looking four two five, I don't think outside linebacker is the number one need. Not if you're in a four-two-five. You got Alshie here, and you got Christian Harris. Uh, you can still go with a, uh, a linebacker, but you don't have to force the issue there at forty-two. Cornerbacks, you bring in Jeff Akuda, C.J. Henderson, Miles Bryant, who was an undrafted kid from Casero's last draft or after the draft there in 2020 with the Patriots to play some slot coverage, um, some nickel dime coverage, do some special teams work. Also, you bring back uh, Desmond King as well. So basically, Miles Bryant subs in for Tavier Thomas. And so they've got these set up and you've got these long, fast corners with pedigree that they're hoping to play to their strengths there. So cornerback, you do want to add a guy. I think you probably add a corner or D tackle in a second. But I think wide receiver is a number one focus because now if we're talking about four two five being the base on defense, well, the base on offense has pivoted to three wide receivers, 11 personnel, mostly. So your third wide receiver is a starter. If that in mind, as much as I love Noah Brown and his versatility and what he gives, you can definitely upgrade that number three wide receiver. And also you've got Nico's contract coming to Tank Dell. You have some injury concerns with both of those guys as well. So I think ideally that can play the X, Y, and Z position. And if an injury hits to these guys, you have a guy that can knock on wood. You hope nothing happens, but you always have to plan. If you're playing for championships instead of playoffs, you always have to have that plan A, B, and C. And I think that's what they've done with some of these free agent ads, and they've set it up with where they don't have to, uh, they don't really have needs. They could go into the season with this roster now, but you can still upgrade the roster if that makes sense. And I think the way you upgrade it is in those 11 personnel, upgrade that wide receiver. And that also happens to be the deepest position in the draft, one of the most talented wide receiver drafts we've seen, all types of wide receivers. So whatever they want, whatever they view in their separator, he's available in this draft, not only in the first, the second, the third, but also the fourth round. So early on, I was of the belief, hey, pick 86, Casero is going to show us what he, shown us what he can do in the third round with Tank Dell and Nico Collins with receiver. I'm saying, let's just let him stay in the strength and let's get that corner and D tackle there in round two. I pivoted when I've seen personally how talented these receivers are. A guy that I've got a first round grade on that will not go in the first round, in my opinion, is Keon Coleman. This guy is a professional wide receiver. He's not going to be the fastest guy. He's not the sexiest guy. He, but he does everything like an NFL wide receiver, all the nuances of the position. And because of the speed and all this nonsense that doesn't have to do with X's and O and play on the football field, 
I believe there's a chance he's there at 42. That's a first round talent you get at 42. And also, I think if we're trying to get into Serio's mind and read the tea leaves a little bit, why do you drop back from 23 to 42? You, your number one pick's going to be at the deepest position, and you can get guys at 42 that aren't that much of a decline from 23. So it feels like everything adds up. I'm not saying it will be the receiver, but the case could definitely be made for 42. And Keon Coleman is the guy I have my eyes on. I personally, I when I was watching the opener for this college football season, I watched the Florida uh, Florida State LSU game, and the that was the first time all college football season that I looked at a player and I said, you know who would look really good in a Texans uniform? <laughs> Who's number four? Keon Coleman? Yeah, that guy. Yes. I would love to see him. I had and, the same. And, I had the same thought. Yeah, through, throughout the draft process, too, watching him drop from like. Oh, he's like a, number, a first round pick to people being like, well, maybe he'll fall to the second. I'm like, yeah, let him fall. I think 42 is the perfect pick for him to fall to. There's there now. There's nice. some people that will say that his fit is weird because I think a lot of a lot of fans view wide receiver three as a slot wide receiver. And so, can you speak to you. the fit of Keon Coleman relative to like you already kind of said where like you know you view the first three wide receivers as starters, but what what makes him fit in a way? Because I don't, I I'm not necessarily sure, but I, I it doesn't appear that he's a slot wide receiver. Well, here's what I would say to that too. Our definition is just like four three base. We have to change our definitions of terms now. With four two five is base. I mean, if you're in at seventy percent, that's your base, right? And thirty percent is going to be the sub package. <laughs> Uh, same thing with that wide receiver position. And so with that, and the guy who talked a lot, whether you like him or not, Bill O'Brien, one of the things he did well, he was meticulous. I mean, I remember his first year, he's out there working with Andre Johnson on the practice. Andre Johnson, Hall of Famer Andre Johnson, and he's meticulous on how he's coming out the cuts and everything. Now, you could question that and all that. I'm fine, but that's not the point. The point is he's so meticulous with what he wants out of his wide receiver, and he cross-trains all of them, X, Y, Z. And that's not that's not new to Bill O'Brien. That's something that's been going on in the league. So we throw that slot label out there. We're going to see tons of people line up in the slot. You could put Nico in the slot. You could put your running. You could get Will Shipley and put him at running back, line him up in the slot. You can line uh, Dalton Schultz in the slot. You can line Tank in the slot. All these guys have skill sets. They're cross trains And with Keon Coleman being uh, being able to play, I think you could play him at the X, the Y, and Z. Knock on wood again. But if Nico got injured, if Tanks uh, got injured, who's stepping up? Who's stepping up in that role? Do you want it to be Noah Brown and Robert Woods being your one, two, and three again? You've got to have that plan A, B, and C. And Keon Coleman is that plan A, B, and C. He can come in. You can work those three wide receiver sets any way you want. I don't give a damn who you put in the slot. You put Tank Dale, Keon Coleman, and Nico Collins with Dalton Schultz and Joe Mixon on the field with C.J. Stroud at quarterback. Yeah, man, you could line Titus Howard in the slot, and I'm good with it. <laughs> man, I I would. Oh, PFF posted that graphic with that, and I would, I would love nothing less than to see C.J. Stroud on the field. It would just be or nothing more. I I always get those two mixed up, but Tom. It's your turn. Go, you got it. I mean, I love that he loves Keon Coleman because we I know, doing, right? We were doing mock draft Mondays. Uh, His pick has been show, Keon Coleman every and Monday. It's been my guy the entire <laughs> time. And the fact that we're, now we're still talking about him in round two, music to my ears. I think he would look great. I, I love the way he's his size is there. Everything's there. I, I just feel like he feels like the right pick. And if Casero is able to make that happen, my fear, my fear is that he's not going to be, he's going to have to move up to get him. I, I have this feeling that Casero is going to move back up maybe 10 spots to get to the top of the second round and go get him. And I just hope it happens because I'm going to be really upset if we have another Tyler Lockett story that maybe you can speak to, sir, where the Texans yeah. could have been owners of Tyler Lockett and we're not. Yeah, that's uh, that's one of my favorite draft stories to tell. That one in the uh, Whitney Merciless, David DeCastro one, because I love David DeCastro. Three offensive linemen, my three highest uh, offensive linemen I graded and loved was Laramie Tunsil, Zach Martin, and David DeCastro. And the Texans almost got DeCastro instead of Merciless. Uh, Lions didn't want to trade out of the spot so the Texans could get ahead of the Steelers. They took Riley Reef. Steelers took David DeCastro. Texans took Whitney Merciless. But to your point, I was on the phone with the Texans back uh, in the third round. I uh, got a call, and 
you don't want to give out the source or anything, but it, it's not hundred percent. And so, um, they're, they're telling me that, um, Hey, we're trading up the room split. Some want Jalen strong. Some want pilot lock it, get a call back. We're trading up. It's lock it. We're locked in. As he's on the phone where he says, shit, I'm like, what? See, he had just Bobby Forno said, taking a lock. He don't even say, uh, they don't even say bye. <laughs> and they hang up the phone. I see Tyler Lockett, Seahawks, Jalen Strong, Texans. And here we are 2024 and it still stings because he would, could still be on your roster as he is with the Seahawks. So, I mean, it it was a devastating story. And I, I, uh, it's trading up. It, Nick Casario, I can't get. The dude's a genius. He's thinking five years in advance or at least two to three years in advance with roster building, salaries, all that. So uh, out of all the GMs, I've been able to kind of get in their head and pick some different stuff and hit every once in a while. Uh, Casario, man, he's so difficult to do. I mean, it's, I get mad at him because I can't figure him out all the time and what his logic is, and it might take me a while. But uh, dude's a genius. If he moves up, I'm fine with it. It makes sense. And let me tell you why Thomas points makes sense. What happens every year after round one? We all know every team goes back to uh, their little think tank and they're like, wait, how are these guys still available? So from pick 33, let's just say roughly say 40, or if we really want to needle the Texas fans, 41, <laughs> you have these top, you know, the Texans are sitting with the 10th pick in the second round. Those first 10 picks, Guys that are typically graded first round from some team or another. And 32 boards, it's not like the media where, hey, everybody's got this guy in the second round. Everybody's got this in the third round. Everybody, Every team's board is drastically different. They're not sharing group think and reading other people's report. They're confident in themselves. And so every board's differently. So you don't know who that guy is they had a first round grade on, but all of them will have someone. And those teams will be stay firm and take that guy of value at 33, 34, 35, or other teams will jump up and get that guy so to thomas's point the texas might have to move up to get that guy but there's also some consideration given to moving back like we know casario doesn't have what is it the fifth round pick he's still missing i think he picked up the six he didn't have a fifth and six i think he picked up the six in the malik trade if i'm not mistaken and then uh he's still without a fifth and uh i don't see him wanting to have that gap between fourth and seventh round, and he got the six. I don't know if he wants that gap for the six because they're betting on that sweet spot there out of the first round because of the depth and the talent and the guys they have graded where they think they will go. So trade back from 42 to 45, you still get a premier talent, especially if you got like three, four rock wide receivers or a corner and a D tackle graded similar. Like, wait, there's no way we can't get one of these five guys we like if we move back five spots. We pick up an extra fifth, fourth. Possibly even a third round, depending how far you drop back. You're still in that second round trading back. That's still where you can get premium picks trading back. And once you get farther to the second round at 59, you're not getting premium picks unless you're giving out. Another thing to consider, if somebody's really desperate, they'll trade you a future first for a high enough second. I don't know at 42 if they'd be willing to do it, but just throwing that out there. Um, but other wide receivers, if they stay firm at 42, Lad McConkey and Xavier Leggett, as far as fit and what Texans fans are looking for in that slot role. I mean, Lad McConkey's the poster boy. His routes are the stupidest thing you should ever see. I mean, you can't you can't stick with him on these routes, and he talks trash. He won't even have the ball thrown to him. He'll run a route so nasty, he'll start pointing and laughing at the cornerback. I love trash talk. So I'm all for that. So if they don't get Keon, who I'd like to see them get, and they stay there, and they're like, hey, we got Leggett. We got Lad McConkey, and we also got guys we like at 59 and 86. If we don't force this issue and go detail or corner, so uh, Lad McConkey's another name I'd look out for at 42. Now, when I look at it, um, you, you've mentioned that you you kind of have looked at defensive tackle, um, and and a player that I, I I feel like for a lot of the off season I was of the impression the Texans were going to go defensive tackle or corner. That's how most of my mock drafts have looked. Um, but a player that I really like at defensive tackle that could potentially be available at 59, maybe probably more 42, but Brayden Fisk is a guy that I think it looks really good. Ooh. But in your studies, who have you seen that the Texans could take in the second round at defensive tackle and who do you think are like the best fits? I've already written the article. Um, it is probably coming out next week, but I'll go ahead for your listeners, give you a little sneak peek. The article 
And what I'm going to do then is draft season. I can't really announce yet, you know, where I'm going to be at um, until April. But uh, what I'm doing for this draft season is I'm, I'm writing articles and adding colors because the cheat sheets just for the fans and different people that like, hey, I don't have time to go and crush all 22 film, you know, 10, 12, 15 hours a day or whatever. But I'd like to know, you know, a detailed, even if they don't agree with it, it makes the draft more enjoyable. You get outside that first round, you're like, hey, let's look at these cheat sheets and you pick the guy you like. Go look at it on film and who you like. You don't have to agree with me, but that's what's the, it, it makes the draft more fun for Texans fans. And all my content this year is geared not only draft, but to the Texans. I also do some things uh, for a couple other things I'll announce next week. Um, but the four guys I wrote in that article, there was four D tackles, whether they fall at 42 or 59. This was one of them. My concern with him is the stock has raised so high. I mean, he lit up the combine. He lit up the pro day. I mean, everything he's been a story uh so fisk is one of those guys we talked about tavondre sweat and the thing about sweat when i first looked at him i'm like oh, this is a guy like terrence cody mount cody from the ravens back in the day big guy you put at the nose leave him there then i watched the film Byron murphy's at the one technique at texas who i love texas have no chance of getting where they're at though but uh byron murphy's at the one technique tavondre sweat at pounds a little hyperbole is at the three technique and more than he's at the one and then i watch on an outside run from the uh from the hash to the numbers to vondre sweat is all the way out past the hash uh getting in assisting on the tackle you, terrence cody wouldn't get outside the guard you know what I mean? <laughs> this this can't be that comparison. So he'll go in the second round, and most of the time, like, well, don't you need more versatility? D'Amico likes a guy that can play some one, can play some three. That's Devondre Sweat. I wouldn't pigeonhole him in as just this big nose that doesn't have mobility. He's got surprising versatility. Another guy, uh, uh, Jazan, or now he said he wants to go by Johnny Newton. I don't think I'd love to see him fall to 42. If he got there as an interior pass rush, he flattens like a defensive end. And what I mean by that, you see defensive ends get that edge and then they flatten at a 90 degree angle straight to the quarterback. You don't see D tackles do that until you put on Johnny Newton's film. Problem is, he's a one dimensional player. And so I don't see D'Amico saying, hey, all these tackles we D tackle like, I'm not taking a one dimensional player there with a first pick, a guy that's going to give us extra pass rush. I need somebody that can stay in there and can hold up. And my guy, my favorite guy, and I wrote about him. And then the next day, Jim Nagy from the senior, senior bowl came out and said, everybody's too low on this guy. And the day prior, I wrote about Michael Hall Jr. And I said, All right, this is a second round guy. I'd be fine if they took him at 42. They played him out of position at Ohio State. So your casual fans would probably go or evaluators go look at the stats like, man, he didn't, uh, he didn't produce. What, what's, what's, what's with the lack of production there at Ohio State? Then you go watch the film, and it's like, man, they've got him at the nose. Like, this thing's not a traditional nose, but he's holding up, he's fighting through it, but it limits his production, obviously, constantly taking on double teams. Well, this guy can play the one, but he's more of a natural three. This guy, when I watched him, I, in my mind, I put a Texans jersey on him because that, that to me is a Texans D tackle and I've got him as a top 50 prospect. And then the next day after I put that out, I saw Jim Nagy came out. So you, you're like when you're against the grain on a lot of stuff, it does feel good to have somebody come out that you respect and you know, their opinion isn't just talk. And you see Jim Nagy come out and say, everybody's too low on Michael Hall Jr. Most people don't have him in the top 100 prospects. He's not getting out the second round. And I'm like, I'm out of eye with you there. Michael Hall Jr. is that guy, and that would be my pick. And if he if you get him at 59 and a receiver at 42 or a corner, like I might sleep the third round because I mean this is just money in the bank, whatever they do after that. No doubt. I thought that that Jason Braddock was bringing Michael Hall into all the mock drafts that I've been seeing. I didn't know it was I thought it was you. No. Um, oh no, Tom, it wasn't me. My I went from seventeen thousand followers when I closed it out in twenty twenty two to now I got like five hundred. So the <laughs> the range in the pool to change perception is it, not there. I'm having to combat a lot of that perception. But now that was Jim Nagy. Uh, he gave that hall to Michael. Hall, uh, he gave that love to Michael Hall Jr. and rightfully so. We got to pump those numbers up on Twitter, Tom. What do you got? 
I got to believe that a, a fellow Ohio State guy, if he's available and CJ's in the room or or anything like that. Great point. I didn't even know think he's about it. ticket for his guy. You know what I mean? He went to the pro yeah. day saying, I'm here for my guys. I got to believe if the if the opportunity presents to go get one of his guys, for sure yeah. that's, that's going to happen. CJ's mom has already put on for uh, Eichenberg and uh, Stover, the linebacker and uh, tight end. Tell me Eichenberg's interesting. Let me tell you about a guy I missed on horror back in the day. Chris Borland. Was he Ohio State? I can't remember right. A undersized linebacker. I watched it again. I'm going off a tape copy so I don't see everything. I had some bad linebacker miss in the day. Chris Borland was undersized. He came in, lit the league up, and unfortunately uh, – uh, he walked away. This was at the time when CTE was all on everybody's brain. A lot of players were walking away in their prime. He walked away, but he was a stud there. A guy that kind of similarly reminds me, not the same apples to apple, you could get probably on day three, Tommy Eichenberg, who you just mentioned. I love his effort, his want to. I could see D'Amico being like, hey, even when he doesn't get there and he doesn't have the size or this or whatever it might be, Show me you want to do it. Show me that you'll get there. And, I mean, I could see him being a D'Amico guy. So you mentioned him here. That's another guy. And uh, also to put a period on the wide receiver, I fell in love with the wide receiver yesterday or the day before. Uh, and someone told me on Twitter, everybody's comparing him to Tank Dell. Uh, Jacob Allen from Arizona. I don't know I've ever but he is undersized. Typically, these size dudes, like look at a Jalen Saunders or something from Oklahoma, who was dynamic and explosive. I think he went in the fourth round. Um, typically, these dudes go fourth round, maybe early third. I would be fine with the Texans taking Jacob Callen at 59 because he's not just a regular 5'8, 170 pound dude. He has a rare blend of quickness, speed, and explosion. That you don't see. It's almost like Malik Neighbors. You know, I mean, in different regards. Just when I hear separator, I talked about Lad McConkey and watching other cornerbacks in this draft. I kept going, like, man, Lad's a separator. Lad's a separator. Jacob Cowling, his middle name is Separator. Don't look it up because I'm lying, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure his middle name is Separator. I mean, you unguardable is the word I put on him. Unguardable. So to your point, if he was 6'2", 190, top where pick. would he be drafted? Top 10 pick. Top 10 pick. We'd be talking about him with neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr. If he was 6'2", 190, we're saying, hey, who are we taking in the uh, top 10 pick, top 5 pick? Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, or Jacob Cowley? It's all size. And it's legitimate because these guys routinely get hurt. When we talk, and I talked about it on uh, Twitter yesterday, that we see those guys in a 165, 170-pound range, and I put out on Twitter, name me somebody that dominated the league. And we got two Eagles receivers, Devontae Smith and Deshaun Jackson. I mean, that's two guys in, what, 16 years? Some people threw out some other names and all that, but they're either one, two years in the league. We can't categorize those yet. Tank Dale falls in there. We saw you know him get injured last year. Again, knock on wood. So with that concern, know if they take two wide receivers and tank and cowing they're both around that 165 170 but if you if that's not a concern for you and we've seen them take Derek stingley over sauce gardner at three with all the injury concerns everybody had sauce over stingley for the most part and it didn't have to do with talent it was the injury concern the texans said we try and they've all we trust our in-house medical we'll evaluate them if they sign off we're good to go that and pick three so I think they'd be fine with it at 59. And if you get it, and then if you get them at 86, most people have them third, fourth round. If you get them at 86, then add it on the wall with the skins on the wall for Casario drafting wide receivers for the Texans in the third round. Uh, another hit with Nico Tank and now Jacob Cal. And we, we keep saying separator, which is what D'Amico said at the combine is, is what they're looking for. What do you think is, is a characteristic in wide receivers that is often overlooked by talent evaluators that usually translates to success at the pro level? Watch Keon Coleman. Keon Coleman is a professional wide receiver, man. Uh, what is four six one? Uh, and I talked about this the other day after I watched Coleman. I'm like, I had a first round grade on Jarvis Landry. I think he went 63rd. 11 wide receivers went ahead of him in that draft. And some were really good. Sammy Watkins went top five. Um, but 
Jarvis Landry went 63rd. Who was the third round pick? You know why? He ran a 477 at the combine. A 4-6-1 at his pro day, same as Keon Coleman. And so they plummeted him. Didn't matter to him that you put on the film and you see him and Odell Beckham Jr. plucking everything, catching in traffic, uh, unafraid of going over the middle. Uh, the film, I'm like, dude, we got to quit. <laughs> we always hear NFL teams saying like, well, 40 times is just 40 times. We don't pay it. BS. They pay it attention. And all 32 teams are different. Some pay it more attention than others. We all know how Al Davis used to be with height, weight, speed guys. But um, Keon Coleman, I don't care if it's 40 times at 480 because the film is the same. He's got a corner on his back on the route. And I put a lot of this film out there uh, on Twitter so people, once these guys get drafted, they can go back on draft day and kind of have an idea of who they added to their team. It's going to stay out there for you. I'm not hogging it up. You know, I've tried to put out a lot of clips for guys that I think could be Texans. So you'll kind of, you know, your Texans fans can go out there and have an idea like, dang, this is who we added in the second, third, fourth round. So, uh, again, everything is geared towards the Texans with the draft this year. And so uh, I'd say with Keon, just a couple things with him, top of the route, he's physical on the top of the route where he'll lean on that DB, quick cut out. You know, uh, we'll also see him safety over the top, corner on his back, ball slightly on the throne. He slows his acceleration down instead of where you see most guys stop and then try to jump back over two guys. He slows down his acceleration, corner on his back, reaches his arms out with his back straight to keep the box out going in the corner and keep the safety instead of, because if he runs through it, safety's lighting him up incomplete pass. But he's seeing the safety, seeing the corner, seeing the ball, boxing out, slowing down, accelerating on securing the catch and going down with no contact. He's a professional wide receiver. These guys, there's different ways to separate. You can separate with quickness. You can separate with speed. Or you can separate by being a professional route runner and having the mindset. Keon, Keon's not the first. He's not the speed guy. But he can separate through being a professional wide receiver and just knowing all the nuances of the position. Oh, yeah. 100%. Tom, what do you got? So I'm dying to know. We just talked about speed. We just talked about how that's not the the the, the be all end all. What does that do for Xavier Worthy? Does he get drafted too high now because he ran what he ran at the, at, at the combine? Is that is that not is he not just a speed guy? Is that a fair? What do you what do you make of Xavier Worthy now? Saying what you just said about Keon Coleman. Before I got to Xavier Worthy, I was asking the same question you just asked me, Thomas. This is just a speed guy getting pushed up in the first round. Uh, let me clarify. This was what my thought was at that time. This is just a speed guy getting pushed up in the end of the first round. Philip Dorsett type, all that stuff like that. John Ross. I go and watch the film, and I'm like, God, I'm glad I didn't put that on record. <laughs> because this <laughs> dude is more of a speed guy. I mean, the cuts, the speed, the end, the route setup. He can just toy guys, and you're watching stuff, and people's like, "What route is that?" I'm like, "That's Xavier Worthy route. That's not a route. That's just Xavier Worthy freestyling and killing dude." And I mean, it's more than speed. And then when yours, uh, I put out that watching him throw that deep ball, and I haven't evaluated uh, when I give these opinions, just watching other guys. So I'm watching the Donnie Mitchell. I'm watching uh, Xavier Worthy, and I see Quinn yours, and, or however you say his name, and he's throwing the deep ball, and I was saying, it reminded me of Geno Smith. His deep ball is like Geno Smith at West Virginia, uh, where he had Tavon Austin, Stev, Stedman, these shorter speed guys. He chunks it out there and just lets these guys or at, like Donnie Avery did it at U of H really well, um, where the quarterback would just chunk the ball out there and allows the receiver to adjust and track the ball. A Donnie Mitchell and Xavier Worthy in the same game, I think it was against Bama, has long shots towards the end zone, and both of them go fully Willie Mays over the head, tracking it, adjusting the body while leaving the guy five yards behind them in the window and just catches it like an egg with no concern. I love hand, hands catchers. I will drop a guy for being a body catcher. These guys are hand catchers. Worthy's got speed. It shows up laterally. It shows up vertically. You can run jet sweeps with him. There's so much. He's a top 20 pick. But this might surprise you. I'm a lot higher on his teammate, Adani Mitchell. The question for me is not who's first between Marvin Harrison and Malik Neighbors. I got Harrison Jr. top five, Malik Neighbors a top 10 pick. Um, 
The question is, who's going to be better between Rome and Adonis Mitchell? And I like Rome. I got them both top 15. I got Rome slightly ahead of them because the more production, the more set is to safer bet and everything. But Adonis Mitchell, man, let me tell you this. He missed games with injury. I think he had like four catches on the season. He comes back from injury. And you know what? All he did at Georgia, he played in the college football playoffs two games each year, right? Won the championship both years at Georgia, right? First championship, first playoff game, catches a touchdown, big game. Second playoff game, catches a touchdown, big game. Next year, Georgia goes back, wants another championship. First playoff game, Mitchell touchdown. Next playoff game in the championship, Mitchell touchdown. Touchdowns, four in each game. Then he switches to Texas, goes into the bowl game, touchdown, not in Mitchell. Or maybe that was the 20, uh, the, yeah, the bowl game. Big 12 championship, 100 yards, multiple catches, touchdown. Six touchdowns. One in all six of each of the biggest games. He's big game AD, saves his best football for that. Even though he's had some injuries knock uh, that's kind of knocked him off, he'll come back and respond. Uh, Donnie Mitchell is going to outproduce uh, his draft stock. And there's talk that him and Keon Coleman could be in the same rounds. When you're talking about fringe first round top 40, I'd have a hard time not trading enough for a Donnie Mitchell if he gets to 30. Mm-hmm. See, I mean, as, I'm a as, Texas fan. I'm I'm all about all of that. <laughs> okay. As a couple of Longhorn fans, That's we can true. talk Longhorns all day. <laughs> oh man, and and see, you know, I'm I'm a Clemson guy. You know, I grew up in Clemson. My wife went to U of H. My daughter goes to U of H now. Uh, so I like U of H. I like Clemson. There's no bias involved in it, though. But yeah, I'm not a Longhorn fan. But that Texas speed is legit. But I'm um, probably if we talk running backs, though, I'm probably going to upset you, though. Because everyone's say, saying Jonathan, everyone's saying Jonathan Brooks a lot for the second round. I do not see it. He's not a top five back in this draft for me. I would take him in the fourth round. He's not a nuanced bass back. He's not a zone runner. He doesn't understand the concept. He doesn't have the patience and the vision for it. Uh, there's five backs I would take before I touch Jonathan Brooks. What you just said to me is you just basically put your hands up and you threw up the horns down. That's what you did to me. No, I'm, 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 oh, nice. That, that nice. leads into my next question. I mean, so how do you view this running? The Texans right now, as it stands, have Joe Mixon and Damian Pierce on the roster. It yeah. stands to reason that they will likely address the running back position. Who are your five prospects ahead of Jonathan Brooks? And who could you see the Texans taking based off how you see the draft shaking out? Yeah, Blake Corn reminds me a lot of Marshall and Jones, Drew. I mean, excuse me, Maurice Jones Drew. Uh, like Blake Corn reminds me so much of Maurice Jones Drew. And I put out a lot of times when I see a guy on tape, I'll go look at their measurements and stuff. And two guys that I was just dumbfounded by uh, the the receiver uh, Malachi Corley from Western Kentucky. I'm like, dang, this dude plays like Debo Samuel. And I, unfortunately, I didn't know everybody else had saw the same thing. I saw a ton of people had to make the comparison. I wouldn't have stepped on their toes, but. Then I went and looked at the measurables, and I don't know if I've ever seen two prospects almost identical at length, height, weight, speed, 43 cone shorts. I mean, across the board, they're almost identical. And so, um, help me out, uh, flip my mind. Who were just, uh, you were just, oh, yeah, Blake, Blake Corum. Well, I watched him. I'm like, hey, man, he's going to fall in the draft just like Maurice Jones drew. We all remember why Maurice Jones drew war number 32 because he said 32 NFL teams passed on. He knew he was the first one talent, but it's the size, the measurable and all the non-football stuff. Why he didn't go in the first round and he made people pay the rest of his career. Blake Corm is the same way. That's my top back in this draft. Right behind him is another guy that's probably not in most people's top five backs. He's my number two guy. Perfect zone fit. Texas could absolutely steal this guy probably in the fourth round. Marshawn Lloyd played for South Carolina, transferred to USC with Caleb. I mean, this dude will jab step you, get the entire defense to pause and all that. He understands the nuances of the game to where uh, in the game of inches, just that sudden pause, jab step to hold him will open up so much, sets up his blocks well, has the vision and sees it. Marshawn Lloyd, I think, is the best ideal value pick for the Texans because corn everyone's talking third round I wouldn't be surprised if he sneaks into the bottom of the second I say no happen I don't know where teams are going to draft uh but Marshawn Lloyd I mean most people got this guy in the fourth round maybe even fifth that dude's going to be a still a natural fit and you don't want to invest too much because you hope for Damian Pierce bounce back you know 
we don't know if it's going to happen, but you feel better with him being the number three running back and only a former fourth round pick. I can see his highlights, and I really want to him to get good. Hundred <laughs> percent. Right, exactly. Uh, it, it's an odd thing to see because he was so dynamic, uh, you know, so dynamic that his rookie season. And then you got Joe Mixon, and when you gave that extension, if he's on a one year contract, you're like, hey. You might go running back second round, but when they gave that extension, he's locked up, still young, locked up for, what, three, four more years? So I think fourth round is probably where you look at running back. If they get a – you got two picks there in the fourth round, so you could use that first or ladder. There's only a fourth pick different, I think, between the two. So if you're afraid of waiting on 127, you could take them at 123 if you got a couple guys slide. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, number three, Trey Benson from Florida State. I don't think he's a great zone fit. But uh, he's just so physical in everything he can do. I think you could force his own. I think you're going to be better off with him in a gap. Um, five was Jalen Wright. I'm trying to remember who four was. It's slipping my mind right now. Who's some of the mm-hmm. top backs out there? Ray Davis, you know, Audric Estime, uh Love both of those guys for the Texans. Braylon the Allen. Don't have them tough up. Nah, I, I like Audric Estime actually better than Braylon Allen. I think Audric Estime is one of those guys you put in a zone system. He doesn't have the fast, uh, the the speed, the burst or anything, but he's just perfect in zone. I mean, he tore up NC State and Peyton Willis. No, uh, was it? it is Will Shipley, yeah. So okay, I don't think I'd go. be that high on Will Shipley. I watched him at Clemson. It seemed like he got banged up a bit. Then you go out. And you study a guy, and you might have a completely different perception of him. And I go out and watch, and I'm like watching this freshman film, and DJ Weagalele, who transferred to Oregon State, was still the quarterback there. They're using Will Shipley as a freshman, lead blocking for DJ. And I'm like, what the hell? And I'm watching, <laughs> and they're successful lead blocks. I'm like, hold on, let me see this. I go sophomore, junior year. Now you've got Phil Maha as a running back that's emerging for Clemson. They've got the double backfield there with the quarterback, uh, Cade Cub- Clubnick. Um, they got both backs in the backfield. So imagine you got Joe Mixon and Will Shipley in the backfield. Will Shipley's lead blocking, almost like it's Allen and Bo Jackson. You know what I mean? It was, it's, I mean, obviously hyperbole with the talent, but you get what I'm saying when you bring on. Uh, Bo Jackson to the Raiders with Marcus Allen, and you've got Marcus Allen lead blocking for Bo Jackson. Well, same thing with Will Shipley. He's lead blocking for Phil Moffa, and he's done it since a freshman for DJ at quarterback. Then you see him out there running up the middle, taking hits, spinning around 360, and gets blindside hit and still keeps his balance. His contact balance is similar to another Clemson running back, uh, Travis Etienne, uh, before his injuries really started piling up. Their contact balance is silly. And so they'll take straight on flush hits, still spin out of it and keep the balance and keep on going. Then also you've got that wide receiver element. And so now you've got Joe Mixon out there, Nico Collins. I mean, there's so many different personnel groupings. You could run with Will Shipley and Joe Mixon. You could motion them out to the slot, let them run wide receiver routes on his stop. Uh, he gets his numbers around quickly, great hands. And then you get him in the open field. Uh, he's dangerous. He's a ballerina. I mean, he'll make you he'll make you miss, take hits, keep balance, spin out of it. And so that's a guy, yeah, Will Shipley, I would take four. Jonathan Brooks is number six, right behind Jalen Wright. All right, sweet. Tom Tom, did you have another question? We're kind of getting towards the end of our time, but No, I'm sitting over here with my notepad and pen, just taking notes. <laughs> just taking, uh, yeah, taking yeah, notes. yeah, yeah. What 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 I think now, what I want to see, I'd love to see a late Will Shipley pick, you know. This six, something like that, where we're going, how did he get him there? You know, yeah. and it'd be good. It'd be, be nice. Good. Yeah. When you said that Marshawn Lloyd played at South Carolina and then you said then he transferred to USC, I used to yeah. live in, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And I remember the first time that someone said, Hey, do you want to go to the USC game? And I said, No, I don't feel like flying across the entire country <laughs> to go to the USC game. And they were like, No, like up in Columbus. And I'm like, US, oh, University of South. I was so bewildered by that when I. Because I grew when up, were you in Charleston? You know, I grew up in Florence, South Carolina, right? I was in Charleston. I did not know that, but I was in Charleston from 2015 through to 2016. Oh yeah, I left in '98. I moved to Houston at 19 years old. I had it for 19 years, and I said, "Let's get to Houston, guys." <laughs> he said, "I've had enough." Yeah. Uh, no, it's it's a what was it? It's out there. There's the a guy ones. from my hometown. In- I didn't mean to walk over you there, James, but there's a guy from my hometown in this draft, and I haven't studied him yet because I haven't got the edge players. He came in highly recruited as a freshman, 
for whatever reason, it didn't pan out. But when I'm watching these other prospects, he keeps flashing. He's from Florence, South Carolina, played at Clemson, Clemson. Excuse me. His name's Xavier Thomas. And I see most people have him fourth, fifth, sixth round. And I'm watching the tape and I'm like, dude, I, so I can't wait to get to him. Not only is he from my hometown, uh, but just the password. So I don't know if he's going that late because he's one dimensional and he can't hold up. I haven't studied him yet, but I do want to plant that seed because if you do want to get that other edge rusher, you know, behind Hunter and Will and Derek Barnett, I know you got Dylan Horton, obviously, uh, you know, with the sad news that came out and then him beating and everything. So great to hear. But if you still want to add some more insurance to that room there, if this guy's going fourth, fifth round, he gives you some juice as an edge rusher, too. I, just, I can't wait to study him. No, yeah, that's a name. And then Mohammed, uh, I can't remember uh, his last name. He's out there at Colorado State. Yeah, I saw Aaron Wilson talking about him the other day. Haven't seen him. Colorado State, right? Yeah, Colorado State. I, I mean, I think that there's a lot of intrigue. I'm surprised we haven't reached a point yet where we're talking about Colorado prospects with, you know, Deion Sanders out there. But he's already, you know, next year. He's already said that there's a list of teams that Travis Hunter and Shadur Sanders can't go to. I can't I imagine the that. Texans that are on that list, but. <laughs> right, right. We'll I wouldn't imagine so. And says that they both should go in the top five picks as well. But that's Dion's game. Dion understands the game. Dion understands perception is more than reality. And I haven't watched either one of these prospects. Maybe he's right. Maybe they both go top four. Maybe they're greatest things to slice bread. But uh, whether it's true or not, Dion understands that he's got such a platform you control the narrative. And once you create the perception, it's so hard to overcome the perception, even if it's reality. 100%. He, he even said, like, directly referenced the Eli Manning situation. It was insane. No, yeah. Yeah, well, was he was smart to do that because he knew the first reaction is he's going to get blowback. How do you want to dictate what you want to say? Well, he takes that bullet out of their gun by saying, yeah, we're going to do the Eli card. Now what are you going to say? Because he already knows Eli and Peyton, that Manning is – prestige and people won't dare you know talk against them or speak ill will to them so Dion Dion everything he says is calculated he's he's smart he controls perception he's overcome so much it was so much bad things in his past and stories that would get most people canceled, but he controls the perception uh, and his personality's dynamic. You just love to hear him and see the smile and everything else. I mean, there's no other person I can think of that would make me tune into um, a Colorado. Uh, who were they playing? They're playing Colorado State. It was Colorado, Colorado State. And I was up at midnight watching that game. Like, why am I watching this? But it's because, because they won Sanders. one game and because he controls the narrative so much. They won one game against a mediocre team and had everybody in the nation talking about Dion was right. Colorado's playing for a championship this year. He even called out reporters. Uh, they're at the press conference after the game, like got <laughs> yeah. all the receipts of what you said and all that. You didn't hear him I go back and tweeted. park on that. At, yeah, you don't see him go back on the park at the end of the season. Nobody calls him out. It's like, well, why are you bringing that up? You know, you got something against Dion. Dion controls the narrative. Hundred percent. And when you control the narrative, there's just so much power in that. But yeah, with that, exactly. we're 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 about at the end of our time. Thanks for coming on. But does anyone? in the in the group here have any final thoughts before we bring it to a close i mean for me i I can't say enough jason thank you so much this has been a lot of fun i've learned a lot there's names that i didn't have that i have now that i got to go back and watch which i knew that's what would happen so i was really excited about this whole thing um can't wait for the draft super excited about whatever the texans intend to do this 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 roster looks so good right now as currently constructed like you spoke to jason i totally believe that now it's best available, best fit. Yeah. And, and I think t- when teams are able to do that, you always see good teams pick good players and find a way to use them. And then they have this gluttony of talent and they're like, well, how did, how did they get all this talent? How did they do that? Well, they didn't have to force themselves into a box and say, I Absolutely. need to take this or I need to take that. So for me, Casario, like you said, is a genius. I cannot wait to see him work and, and, you know, then we get to talk all about that and then line them up and let's well, go in fresh new duds. Absolutely. It's great. Before I get out of here, it's great to see you again, Thomas. For those that don't know me and Thomas, go back to 2018. Awesome dude. Great personality. Support him and James in the bullpen. I appreciate you guys inviting me on and sharing your platform with me. Uh, needle, you Longhorn fans, a little bit here on my way out. Another wide receiver. 
your rival Aggie. I did not expect to watch Anaya Smith and expect to say that of the 20, 22 receivers I've watched at this point, that he would be the guy I'd want for the Texans blocking in this zone scheme at wide receiver. Short arms, limited wingspan, small hands, doesn't show up on film. I mean, you'll see the short arms show up on blocking and stuff. He'll get stymied some. Effort, attaches, dog, teammate. He's the Max Melton of wide receiver. Max Melton's a corner I got going. He could fit with the Texans at 42, a lot higher on him. Him and Anaya Smith are D'Amico Ryan's type team guys. First one over the cell, genuine excitement, 100% effort every play. Anias shocked me. He'll be there in the fourth round, had the stress fracture news, the bad measurements. He'll be there on day three. If the Texans, and I don't expect them to do this, if they don't take a receiver in the first three rounds, they're in the fourth round. Anias Smith would be my selection there uh, with one of those fourth round picks. I've seen him. I've seen a lot of him. I actually saw, I think Patrick Storm actually mocked him to the Texans in the seventh, which was, oh, nice. seemed, yeah, that would be a, a nice pickup based off what you just said. Maybe his short arms will uh, send him down to that draft pick. I think he's got eight and a half inch hands, too, and you don't want guys with under nine inch hands. I don't see it as an issue on the film, though. And he's got the short arms. Don't see it. He's still going to be willing. He'll get into the muck like bigger receivers in this class want. Skill set is there, contributes. He, he, stress fracture in the shin, the injury in 2022. Did y'all know that injury in 2022 came from him blocking? (laughs) <laughs> so, I mean, the proof's in the pudding with that guy. Damn it, oh, Jason. Yeah. I talked myself into Edrin Cooper. I was like, all right, if we got to do another Aggie, I'm okay <laughs> Too there. Too many Aggies. And now I got to look many at Aggies. another one. You know, Ugh. Keon Here's Green, still got us, he still got us a yeah. bad taste in our mouth. <laughs> well, get you out of that situation. Here's your pivot. I know you guys got to go. Last thing I'll drop on you. UTEP guy, linebacker, his measurables, everything, identical. Blew my mind away. Uh Tyrese Knight from UTEP, linebacker. So if you don't want to commit to Cooper, because I got a first on him and a top 50 on Wilson, kind of flipped from where everybody else got him. Not big Wilson guy, too many missed tackles, goes high, a lot of other issues as well. Tyrese Knight, I've got a friend, second, third round grade, bottom day four. Look at the height, weight, measurements, everything else. That's your pivot so you don't have to get too aggy, Thomas. (laughs) <laughs> nice. I've seen you tweeting about Knight, and and I, I've been watching those videos, and I think I think he could be a good pickup, it's, especially with what you talked about with linebacker and how the Texans are shifting t- towards the four two five. I think that might be like more where they go. But thanks yeah. for joining us, Jason. I'm gonna plug your socials real quick. I know you're at Jason Braddock on uh, on Twitter. Do you have any other? means by which you post on social media or is that I closed just down all social medias in 2022 focused on my health and mental and just well it seemed like the world was going crazy and i was part of that issue can't fix the world you can only fix yourself so i'm back now twitter's going to be the only social for me uh and then i'll probably have an announcement i'm expecting next week so y'all stay tuned for that and uh hopefully hopefully people write it in the market for it no, yeah, J- Jason, you, you kind of gave us a little preview earlier in the show. You got a big announcement coming up. We're excited to hear about what's what's going on. What, what's going on? It's not. Don't call it a comeback. You were here the whole time. You know, that's, <laughs> nice. what, that's what they say. So, that's it. Um, Tom is on Instagram now. I finally got him to take his Instagram off private, so you guys can follow him. It's at TC Tom One. Um, he's also at Third Coast Tom on Twitter. Uh, great nice. insights from him, and especially with baseball season coming up, you got to give Tom a follow because. Tom is, is in the, the PSF space and uh, also does bourbon and Brandy. baseball with Susie. So get, if you're looking to get your Astros fixed, Tom has uh, many a different ways to hear him talk about the Astros. So go ahead and get on that. Um, I'm N1 Texans fan. I do talk about the Astros um, on occasion on, on social media. So if you're interested in the Astros, I'm also a good follow, <laughs> although probably not as good of a follow as Tom. Um, and, and yeah, this has been the show. Once again, thanks for tuning in. Uh, As always, stay classy, Houston, and vamos Texans.